thank you all so much for being here today um, and welcome to our first session of our University of Western States Chiropractic Workshop Week. We're so thrilled that you decided to attend today. My name is Brigan Arnett and I'm an admissions advisor for our Doctor of Chiropractic program here at UWS. In this morning's session, you'll have a chance to hear from our Associate Dean of the College of Chiropractic, who will speak about our program curriculum, and one of our incredible clinical science professors, who will be speaking about the importance of having an evidence-informed practice. We anticipate this session being about 45 minutes to an hour long, and it will be recorded for those that can attend today, um, or if you have to leave early for any reason, you'll be able to come back to it. Um, all six of our Chiropractic Workshop Week sessions will be added to our website in the next week or so for all to review. If you have any questions for our presenters today, please feel free to utilize the Q&A chat function at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we'll answer your questions live, via chat, or email after the session. As long as you formally registered for the session and we have your email on file, then we can email you. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce you all to our first presenter, Dr. Martha Kayser. Dr. Kayser has been an educator since 1989. She earned her master's degree in adult education from Antioch University in Seattle in 1997 and her doctor of chiropractic degree from Logan University in 2008. Dr. Kayser has worked in chiropractic education since 2008, both in the classroom and in administration. She completed the radiology residency and fellow program in 2012 at Logan University. Dr. Kayser has been invited to present posters and platform presentations at national research and education conferences. She currently has numerous peer-reviewed publications. In 2018, Dr. Kayser joined University of Western States as the Assistant Dean of Preclinical Education. In her free time, she enjoys traveling, hiking, camping, kayaking, golfing, and frisbee. <laughs> so without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Kayser. Thank you very much, Brigham. Appreciate that introduction. Welcome, folks. I am excited to have you all here asking about or inquiring about the curriculum. And I'm going to go through some of that. So let me share my screen. And please don't hesitate to ask questions as um, Regan referred to in the Q&A. And I will try to get to them. If I can't answer those questions, I will be happy to send you my email address and we can communicate that way. So let's get started with that overview I just promised. So this is about the Doctor of Chiropractic program, about you becoming a chiropractic physician. The mission of the University of Western States is to advance the science and art of integrated healthcare through excellence in education and patient care. Our vision being quality of life and wellness are advanced through transformative education and healthcare. And I'm gonna focus on those two things that are bolded. I'm gonna talk about our excellence in education and I'm going to talk to you about transformative education, taking you from an individual who does not have a lot of experience possibly in healthcare. We're going to introduce you to healthcare. We're gonna introduce you to the, our curriculum and you'll be transformed into this chiropractic physician in the future then. And you may ask, how long does that take? We are a 12 quarter program. So our doctor of chiropractic program, the curriculum is completed in three years. We have very experienced faculty, Dr. Schultz being one of those experienced individuals. We have faculty that come to us with PhDs, master's degrees, diplomates, and many, many of our faculty have clinical practice experience, years upon years of working with patients. They will impart their their experience to you as you go through the curriculum. It is an integrated curriculum. Some of you have heard the term vertical integration and horizontal integration. So we're going to take these courses, we're going to tie them together in a nice little package for you, deliver it to you so it makes sense. So in some quarters, you're going to have the faculty working very closely to integrate the materials. But then there's also times when these faculty and Oftentimes in the upper quarters, they have communicated closely with some of the folks in earlier quarters or quarters in the future in talking with the clinical educators, and they will provide that information to you so that it all makes sense. So that's that vertical integration, if you will. You're going to apply all these skills you learn. You're going to apply it when we, it comes to clinical reasoning and when it comes to diagnosis. 
So all of these things you'll be learning those and applying will hopefully in positively impact patient outcomes. And the final thing I want to say about the curriculum, it is a rigorous curriculum. We want you to be very competent chiropractic physicians when you leave our when you leave our classrooms, when you leave the clinic. So it is a rigorous program. We will help you get through it. There are lots of opportunities and lots of support, but I do want to emphasize that as well. So we have some educational departments. We break down our, you may have noticed if you've looked through our catalog at all, we break down our courses into basic science courses. We break them down into chiropractic sciences. That's also known as those technique classes, the clinical sciences, clinical education, and then clinical internship. I'm gonna go through each of those departments. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about some of the courses as well. So the basic sciences, those start in year one and two. And I know you'll be hearing from Dr. Borman in a later session. He'll talk to you a little bit about the anatomy program, but these courses are all foundational. We're gonna take these, uh, they're heavy in science, right? They're heavy in those basic sciences because we wanna prepare you for clinic and we wanna prepare you for the licensing exams, whether they are the, the US licensing exams or international exams that you may need to complete in order to be a chiropractic physician. So lots of foundation material. That doesn't mean though we don't tie that to clinical education. Just an example, we have an instructor, Dr. Williams, in our foundational sciences, or our basic sciences, and she works closely with Dr. Stetcher, who is in our clinical science department, one of our radiology experts or radiologists. And so she works closely with him so that this information, this heavy information about amino acids and nucleotides, um, it comes alive in some of these other areas, whether it's radiology or whether it's talking to one of the clinical educators that was talking to a, a patient about nutrition. So to kind of give you that application to why you're learning the material. Those sample courses in the basic science include the human anatomy instruction. We do use prosected cadavers. So you get the opportunity to explore our cadavers in our old building at this point. We've got a wonderful lab set up there. We have a wonderful instructor, Dr. Borman, who is going to take you through the all, all aspects, I guess, of the cadavers, if you will, focusing initially on the spine, then going to the extremities and learning about all the joints, whether it be shoulders and knees and hips, and, and then finally get into the, um, the organs. So looking more at the heart, lungs, and and um, pelvis. That's, that's a little bit about human anatomy instruction. You get those three classes of human anatomy instruction in the first three quarters of the program. Then the structural biochemistry and the cell bio classes, those are those that real heavy content that, that you will use in clinic in the future, whether it's when you're talking to a patient about nutrition or you're just trying to help them better understand something they have a question about. So structural biochemistry, cell bio, intermediary metabolism, that ties in closely again with, with nutrition, histology, learning about the appearance of some of these tissues. Those, that's a helpful component when you start talking to a patient about the healing process. Human development, neuroanatomy, neurophysiology, physiology, pathology. We really want you to be well prepared to understand all of the conditions that can affect the human body so that you can talk to your, your own patients in a very informed way. And genomics and microbiology are also something that comes up in the basic sciences. Let's look at our next department, our clinical science department. The clinical, I had noticed there or noted on the, with the basic sciences, those are usually year one and two Clinical sciences are kind of woven throughout all of the quarters, quarters one through 12. Um, there are technique courses. They're, um, they're the kind of courses that people think of when they think of chiropractic education, right? Getting your hands on those patients, learning how to um, assess a patient, whether it's through orthopedic tests, learning how to palpate, determining where the transverse process is or where the, the um, spinous process is all those things we're going to teach you and you're going to leave feeling very confident when you come when you're using your hands and you're treating patients um, these individuals closely coordinate with the 
the young clinical educators. So we're, the intent is for you to, to take all of this information from your technique courses and use them in patient care. You'll get to do that when you get into clinic and some of these clinic internships. So we work closely with those clinical educators. We talk to them and the faculty talk to them, make sure that what they're learning in this preclinical manipulation courses, if you will, or these technique courses really is being used in the clinic. Some of those sample courses, immediately you learn surface anatomy. You learn where certain things are on the body. Dr. Borman in anatomy is taking you on a deeper dive into the human body, right? Well, you also need to know just the surface anatomy so you can coordinate um, when a patient points to something, well, what, what's under there kind of thing. So you'll learn the surface anatomy. You'll learn the spinal biomechanics. How are things moving? How should they be moving? Spinal assessment, spend a lot of time assessing the spine. And I referred to the TPs or the transverse processes, the um, spinous process, making sure things are moving or if they're stuck, how should they be moving? Now, those kind of things you'll learn in spinal assessment. Thoracic, pelvic, lumbar, and cervical manipulation courses. Those are where you're learning to really focus on patient treatment. If a patient comes in and they have a, something going on with any of these areas of the spine, you're going to learn to treat those things. You're going to learn to treat them in, a mul in multiple ways. We're not just going to teach you how to um, adjust in one way. Your patients are going to need you to be knowledgeable in treating them in a variety of ways. So all the way from pediatric patients to geriatric patients, things change, things, you, you treat patients differently. So you're gonna learn in those technique courses all the different ways to um, set these patients up and, and um, treat them. We'll teach you rehab principles, a lot of focus on some, some um, soft tissue techniques, tissue biomechanics. You'll sit in lecture classes and you'll learn joint dysfunction, pain syndromes, You'll learn about chronic pain. You're going to be in the labs working with the instructors and learning the orthopedic assessments of the upper and lower extremities. You're going to do a lot of muscle testing and joint play and manipulation. So you get the idea. You're going to be able to take an individual and really thoroughly assess them and not only to figure out what's wrong with them, but also how are you going to treat this patient. PT modalities. The, ultrasound. Some of you probably, many of you have probably um, heard about ultrasound and we'll teach you how to use that as a treatment modality for patients. Um, taping and splinting. We have a course that it both upper extremity and lower extremity. And then as you progress towards clinic and even in clinic, you'll have very case-specific courses. So your instructors will talk to you about certain cases around thoracic, lumbar, and cervical spine so that you'll learn to diagnose those, those um, conditions and also manage those conditions. So all that encompasses our clinical sciences. Let's move on to chiropractic sciences. That was another department. These are, this is also, again, woven throughout the curriculum. You're going to find these chiropractic sciences with the prefix CSC um, all throughout the, the curriculum. These, this is heavy on radiology and imaging courses. It's heavy on associated sciences, pharmacology, genital urinary survey. Um, and it's heavy on the EIP courses. And Dr. Schultz is probably going to talk a little bit about that because that's something that he's really involved with. I see his thumbs up there. He's really involved with those EIP courses and he does a really nice job of teaching those courses. So I'm, I'm excited to hear from Dr. Schultz about that. But those are all, they encompass the chiropractic science courses. It is a collaboration among all the departments. You know, basic sciences, I kind of said, we, you'll collaborate with a specific department. This is a department that really collaborates with everyone very well because there's so much here. It's a radiology courses. And um, so they're going to be involved with the chirotechnic courses. They're gonna be involved with the basic science courses and just those the conversations and the re-spinning of material, if you will, in the chiros practic sciences when it comes to radio, radiology and radiographic anatomy. Info mastery, that's one of our EIP courses. And I apologize, I don't think I told you what EIP stands for. Evidence informed practice. So that's info mastery or information mastery is our first course there. We have a phenomenal instructor that will take you through all the ins and outs of the library and how you do um, 
searches for material. So your patients are going to expect you to be experts. They're going to want you to present to them the, the most recent literature on their condition or how to treat their condition with the most recent information available. Well, that's where you learn in information mastery how to really find those articles, if you will. Um, again, a, a soft tissue normal imaging. So you're going to be able to look at the osseous structures on, on an X-ray or a um, CT scan or an MRI, but you're also going to focus and we're going to teach you about the soft tissue structures, not just the osseous structures. Therapy studies, systematic reviews, diagnosis studies, that's all in Dr. Schultz's bailiwick. I won't steal his thunder. He can talk about that here shortly. And then um, he's also in, in the instructor for imaging clinical decision-making. What kind of studies should you be ordering for a patient that exhibits X, Y, or Z. So he takes you through some of that clinical decision making. Clinical laboratory, when I was a student, and I don't hear it as much around here, but we called that the stab lab. So that's where you learn to do some of those blood draws in the clinical laboratory. That's where you're going to learn to do a urine analysis, because those are some of the things that and then chiropractic practices are going to be involved with. So we take you through all of that with a very phenomenal instructor. All of our instructors are phenomenal though. Um, X-ray positioning, I was just visiting that classroom. Um, they were looking at, the students were learning how to set up a cervical X-ray. So she was taking them through collimating the X-ray equipment and, and so that the students would really get a, a good view of the cervical spine. X-ray, so X-ray positioning for both spine and extremities as well. Bone pathology, those are great courses if you want to dive into arthritides, trauma, anything on an x-ray, CT scan, or an MRI that's not, that is out of the ordinary. You're going to learn about that in bone path. And then the dermatology courses, chiropractors are, see a lot of skin, right? They're, you're treating a patient and you are putting your hands, uh, skin contact. So you, you want to know if you see anything that may need some further um, attention. So we teach you about all the things, all those things in dermatology. Doctor-patient communication, that's another course Dr. Schultz is, is um, well-versed with. He talks about how do you talk to these patients? How do you communicate with them effectively? They may come in with X, Y, or Z as far as a physical condition, but you got it. There's also a lot going on with these patients. How do you communicate with them effectively? We have nutrition courses, pharmacology courses, I re referenced genital urinary survey. That's both the lecture and lab. Then we've got a number of business courses. We want to set you up to be a successful business person if you choose to go out on your own. But we also want you to be familiar with all the ins and outs of businesses for what, however you're going to um, work with patients in the future. Could be an associateship, for instance. Um, and then the clinically applied evidence courses. Again, Dr. Schultz will talk to you about that. And we do offer minor surgery and proctology. Those are all of our chiropractic sciences. That's a lot of associated sciences and a lot of radiology and evidence informed practice courses. And then we have chiropractic sciences. These begin in, um, you know what? This slide is not accurate. Regan, I apologize for that. And I apologize to all of you. This should be the clinical ed department. So. We'll correct that before we post that. So this is the clinical ed department that begins in quarter six. That's where you start working with standardized patients. Some of you may be familiar with what a standardized patient is. Um, those are actors and actresses that we bring in from the community and they're gonna portray certain cases for you. So you get to go into our, our Romero Assessment Center and you get to work with standardized patients. You also get to work with some standardized patients in the doctor-patient communication courses. So that's, a, that's an exciting program that, that we have here at University of Western States where you get to work with these standardized patients. Um, you also are going to learn how to diagnose all sorts of spinal disorders. And in the clinical ed courses, you really, these instructors work closely again with the clinic. I talked about how the um, Cairo Technique courses work with the clinical educators, but this group does very closely work with clinical educators as well, because this is where you learn all about diagnosis and management, right, and that patient interaction. So we've got to make sure that we're sending in the preclinical program 
right, beginning in quarter six, we're sending folks that are, are competent and that are going to be able to practice the material they're learning. You'll get to practice that material then as you go into clinical internship. This also includes our clinical training courses. Those are both lectures and labs. You'll work closely again with standardized patients and you're going to learn extremity diagnosis and management, spinal diagnosis and management, all of those kind of things. And some of the soft tissue thing, um, uh, diagnoses as well, whether it's GI, gastrointestinal diagnosis and management, cardiopulmonary diagnosis and management. That's where you get to really learn how to use the stethoscope, how to um, assess lungs, and then head and neck diagnosis as well. That's all of our clinical education courses. I talked a little about, a bit about clinical internship. You, that's another department, if you remember from the first slide. I'm not going to steal anybody's thunder there. Clinical internship is going to be talked heavily about in, I want to say Wednesday, Bregan, if I'm correct there, and she's nodding her head. So you'll learn all about clinical internship. And I do just want to end up just brief note of methods of instruction. We use team-based learning. We use case-based learning. Our instructors use small group synchronous learning. So in our radiology courses, you'll log in in Zoom and your instructor will be there and you'll be broken into small breakout rooms, small groups, and that would be a synchronous instruction, small group instruction. We also have small group face-to-face -face instruction. I just, as I mentioned, the X-ray positioning lab is a great example of that. It's a small group of students that are learning how to position the patient when, X, when they take X-rays. Large group lectures, we have a hall that holds um, 100 plus students, and that, that is oftentimes a really great way to disseminate a lot of information to a large group of people. So we do do the large group lectures as well. And then we do some of those synchronous though. Faculty will say, let's go ahead and log in at 840 on Tuesday mornings. We're all going to be there together. I'm going to disseminate information. You're going to ask questions, interact with your peers in the chat function. So that would be the synchronous instruction, but that could also be large group. And then there's asynchronous courses. As you get up into some of the clinical um, internship programs, we want you to have the opportunity to really um, involve yourself, delve into the clinic experience. So that might mean that we put some courses fully online um, with some opportunities to have some face-to-face -face interactions as well. So those are our asynchronous courses. And then there's always one-on-one -on -one tutoring, whether it's a formal tutoring process through our student services, or it's faculty that says, you know what, let's set up a weekly session so that I can review some material with you. That's all I have. I don't see any questions there, but it, please, if you have any questions or comments, I went through a whole lot of stuff. If you don't even have a question right now, you can't think of anything, please just send me your email address and I will reach out to you or I'm sure Bregan can put the um, my email address in there too. So feel free to reach out as you need to. Bregan, that's all I have. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Kayser. Um, again, if, any, if anybody has questions, please go ahead and submit a question in that Q&A chat function. Um, before I introduce Dr. Schultz, I am going to also post in the chat um, the link in case you are interested in any of these future sessions that we're doing tomorrow and Thursday um, that Dr. Kayser and I have both referenced, what, like multiple times at this point. So if there is more sessions that you want to come attend, like the one about the clinic tomorrow and diagnostic imaging, the one about sports medicine and chiropractic. Um, we have some more sessions tomorrow um, and of course Thursday. So there's the link. Hopefully everybody can see that in their chat. And yes, um, I'm happy to send um, Dr. Kaiser's Kaiser's email in the chat as well um, in just a minute. Um, but without further ado, if there's no questions and I don't see anybody popping up, sounds like you're super concise, Dr. Kaiser. So thanks. Um, I'm going to introduce you all to um, Dr. Gary Schultz, our one of our professors of clinical sciences. Um, Dr. Schultz graduated from National University of Health Sciences in 1985. He subsequently pursued a residency in radiology at Los Angeles College of Chiropractic, LACC, completing his radiology training and achieving board certification as a chiropractic radiologist in 1988. 
Over the next 11 years, he practiced full-time as a chiropractic radiologist while also working as full-time faculty, radiology department chair, and radiology, radiology residency director at LACC. Dr. Schultz has pursued several scholarly interests in radiology, clinical decision-making, ethics, and professionalism. He's published numerous articles in peer-reviewed journals, book chapters, as well as being invited to provide scholarly presentations um, at research gatherings over the years. Dr. Schultz joined UWS in an administrative role in 2006 and joined the UWS chiropractic program faculty in 2013. In his spare time, Dr. Schultz enjoys um, spending time with his family, golfing, gardening, cooking, wine tasting, and creating craft cocktails. Um, so without further ado, we can't wait to hear from you, Dr. Schultz. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our little presentation world. Um, well, let's just get right to it here. Regan, I hope I can make this work. Yes, I can. Hang on. There we go. I got it. Sweet. Hang on here. I'm going to modify my I think I am. No, I'm not. Okay, cool. This is the screen you get. So top luck. Welcome. Um, so my task today is to talk to you a little bit about science and the role of evidence-informed practice at UWS. Um, and I want to start off by saying that we have spent an extraordinary amount of time, an extraordinary amount of money, and an extraordinary amount of energy in bringing evidence-informed practice into the mainstream, not only of what we do, do as clinical practitioners at UWS, but how we teach and what we teach within the curriculum. So if you are looking for a faith-based program in chiropractic, if you're looking for something that runs away or does issues science or doesn't provide credibility to science, we may actually be a super bad fit for you. But in the off chance, and I'm making a bet that you are this type of person, you believe that science is a fantastic way to think about and to operate through a clinical practice scenario, then you're in the right spot. Um, I like to think of science and I have been involved with science since the very earliest days of my chiropractic education back before science was even really invented in chiropractic. Um, science is more than just a way to explain what's going on or what's not going on. It's actually a way of thinking it's an approach to problem solving that incorporates the best of what is known about a subject into the things that we actually endeavor to do as practitioners. Evidence-informed practice as a subset of the science universe is really an emphasizing of clinical decisions that are based on the best available evidence, blending that with a clinician's best judgment based on their experience and their knowledge, and then blending that with patient preferences, their context, their expectations, and their values. So when people talk about evidence-informed practice, you'll sometimes hear somebody say, oh, that's cookbook practice, and they only do what the science says they can do, and they don't think outside the box, and that is absolute poppycock. That's garbage. Actually, evidence-informed practice is one of the most creative and thoughtful ways to approach practice. The downside is it's challenging. It requires that you're a lifelong learner. It's a, it, requires that on some level you're humble, that you're willing to accept that you don't know everything and that things come up that are new and you have to change how you think about things. So just some observations from an old guy. You can know a lot of things through experience alone, but I'm here to tell you from my experience that while experience is a great teacher, it is a terrifying taskmaster. And worst, it's inefficient and slow. So you can learn a lot of things just by experience alone, but you're gonna spend a ton of time and in the process, you're probably gonna hurt people if you're in a position to try and help them. Supplementing experience with systematically acquired knowledge that somebody else brought to the forefront for you. Oh, wow, my lights just went out, cool. Apparently it's time for me to shut up. Nope, not gonna do it. Um, so using the experience from others that have been published in order to enhance your learning Helps, making, helps to make your decision-making more objectively complete. And it's also a much, much more efficient way to get to the right answers. 
I like to think that the best clinical decisions are really are an amalgamation, a real bringing together of what is known plus your experience plus the patient's needs. And I think it's really important to point out that EIP specifically focuses on making sure that we somehow translate what the science tells us into what the patient understands. So the burden of someone who practices evidence-informed practice is not only to know things, but also to be able to explain things to people who are not scientists, who do not have a background in these things. So the challenge is greater, but I also think the satisfaction is greater. So science teaches us more than just the facts. It teaches us how to reason through problems. Not everything that we need to know is taught through science. In other words, there are things that you're going to face in practice, probably on a regular basis, for which science has not come up with a conversation. So you're going to need a process by which you can reason through those things all by your lonesome. So science gives us systematic and empirical thinking instead of the replacements for that, which are mystical, magical, and wishful thinking. I really do believe that as a physician, your responsibility in the 21st century is to be deferent to and aware of what science offers us and to be able to work through the process of scientific thinking to arrive at good clinical decisions. One of the most important things that evidence-informed practice tries to avoid for us is the Dunning-Kruger effect. And I don't know if you're familiar with this, but in the late 1990s, came up with a series of observations about the behavior of people who, shall we say, weren't real good at what they were doing. And what they discovered was it was not infrequent for people who really didn't know what they were doing to have incredibly high levels of confidence about what they thought they knew that they were doing. And so the Dunning-Kruger effect really was a way to try and describe those people who miscalculated their competency by large volumes of space. They had high confidence in their ability when in objective measures, they had terrible competency. And so one of the things that evidence-informed practice does for you is that it constantly challenges your triangulation as to what you know versus what you think you know. And in the end game of Dunning-Kruger, what we really want to avoid is being really, really uninformed because there is a thing called ignorantly ignorant. You don't know what you don't know, which means you're unlikely to ever find out. And so we definitely want to avoid that. So there are progressions in, in evidence-informed practice from the novice all the way through the experts. And, and this slide really lays out for you how that looks. So you start in a very naive position where you really don't have a substantial foundation in research. And you either have very limited or some perhaps very spotty, non-coherent knowledge of what the EI principles are. And that progresses through having a basic understanding, but not really being able to apply it, to being able to apply it in a limited or routine set of circumstances, to higher levels of mastery, where you begin to be able to actually use evidence-informed practice as a way of thinking, and you can solve abstract problems that have never really been solved before. So that's really the progression of EIP. And not surprisingly, it's something that we at UWS want to take you through. So what are these competencies? Well, evidence-based chiropractic competencies are being able to find high quality evidence in the literature databases that exist in the 21st century. And let me take you back to when ice cream sodas were a nickel. When I was in residency, there was no internet-based evidence searching strategies. You had to go to a library and you had to look stuff up in what amounted to giant dictionaries. And then you had to go running through hallways looking for journals that had been archived on walls and in uh, shelves. Be done in the old days. Now it's about four clicks. And can I just say, um, for all the awful things that the internet has done for us, this is not one of those things. This is an awesome thing. It's been an actual revolutionary transition for healthcare providers and for the public to be able to search for scientific evidence online and to get instantaneous access to very diverse and high quality pieces of work that have been done anywhere around the world. We also want you to be able to read and comprehend the evidence that you find, to be able to interpret the results of studies, which, which yes, involves the S word, statistics. But don't worry, 
we don't do big math here. What we do is we try to inform you as to what statistical tools are used for most studies and how to interpret them. You don't have to know how to build the watch. You just need to know what time it is. That's how we approach this. Um, we want you to be able to critique the quality of the science that you encounter because not all science is created equal. Some science is very limited in its utility for us because of methodological flaws, because of the size of the study. So there are lots of things that limit one's ability to rely on scientific results. And we try to help you find out which ones are the deal breakers and which ones are not really things to worry about too much. And then of course, we want you to be able to actually apply all of these skills in a circumstance where a patient needs answers and you're the one that has to find them. So how do we get there? Well, the short answer is we get there gradually, a little bit at a time, each quarter in the program, you're going to learn a little bit more about various aspects of clinical studies and research. So at UWS, we definitely focus our time on clinical research studies, and there are five different types of those. I've listed them for you here. Um, and so we spend most of a quarter on therapy studies. We talk about diagnosis studies and harm or prevention studies. We talk about studies related to the prognosis of patient conditions. And then lastly, and perhaps probably most relevant for you when you get into practice is systematic literature synthesis. And this is where scientists gather all of the evidence on one subject, they amalgamate it, and then they integrate it and synthesize it so that you can get one giant answer, one precise answer from a variety of different studies. And so we spend some time on that because that's where the real rubber hits the road stuff is. So where are they taught? Well, just like mayonnaise, they're pretty much everywhere. So you get some information seeking in, uh, in first quarter and second quarter, you actually have to apply your seeking skills to find some real geocache obscure information in a class I actually teach where I let you choose a chiropractic technique that's out there someplace. I've got a huge list of them and you have to go research it and see what it's all about. Um, and that proves to be quite a challenge for a lot of students, but a lot of fun, a ton of fun. Um, in Q3, you're gonna be using science-based pr principles to look at what chiropractors do and how it affects them. In Q4, we get into some of the nitty gritty of the core evidence-informed practice courses where you're going to find, read, interpret, and critique the strengths and limitations of therapy studies, specifically randomized controlled trials, which are kind of the sine qua non of therapy studies. In Q5, you're gonna spend some time looking at diagnosis and prognosis studies, we also take you into clinical prediction rules and clinical practice guidelines because these are types of synthesis of literature that are actually super applicable in practice. You can take a clinical prediction rule, read that study and say, oh my gosh, the examination procedures that I have and the order that I have them in my practice is super inefficient and it's leading me down the wrong road. I should adopt this one and change your practice and make your diagnoses more accurate. In quarter seven through nine, you're going to be applying evidence informed practice skills in a variety of clinical circumstances, not only from a diagnosis perspective, but also from a treatment perspective and a patient management perspective. And then the capstone of the EIP curriculum is in quarters 10 and 11, you actually have two journal club style classes where you're in small groups, somewhere around a dozen, 14 students, and you go through journal articles as a team. And I happen to think that evidence-informed practice, particularly the skills development piece of it, is a team sport. And it helps you not only to develop your own skills, but also to see how other people have done it. And that helps to bolster your strengths in this particular area. So why do we spend so much time on this? Why is this so bloody important? And, and let's just get right to it. What's in it for us? What makes it better for us? Well, I'll tell you what, you're safer and you're more clinically efficient, you get better patient outcomes, you get better patient appreciation, you're better able to teach and to defend your decisions because they're rationally arrived at decisions. They don't necessarily require leaps of faith to get there. So you don't have to talk patients into believing something improbable first and then trying to make relevance out of that. You actually get to systematically use the scientific process to explain to patients what's going on with them. And I'll tell you what, there are a few things that patients appreciate more than a credible explanation of a problem that's really worrying them. So we are more credible as providers in the healthcare industry when we use science. We are more knowledgeable 
about healthcare matters that are even outside of our lane. We just understand things better. We're able to process abstract information better. We refrain from using ineffective or unsafe approaches. Even if we thought they were safe last year, new evidence comes out and says, eh, not so much, then that gives us an opportunity to be on top of it and to remove those unhelpful practices before we hurt somebody. We're also more apt to recognize and to respect the lanes of other experts as they practice in their lanes. There's nothing better than knowing what you're good at and knowing what somebody else is better at than you. That's what we call patient-centered practice. You're doing what's best for the patient, even if what's best for the patient is that they need to somebody who has a better skill set in that area than perhaps we do. So in short, we're more professional and we're more credible when we base what we do out of science. We're less odd or unorthodox in the eyes of the broader health com care community, which in the past has been a problem for our profession. So just a couple final thoughts. As a chiropractic physician in training at UWS, you're gonna learn via three basic paths. You're gonna build knowledge and skill as an individual. You're gonna practice by yourself in getting better with, those, with that knowledge and with those skills but you're also gonna practice in groups to facilitate your ability to contribute to that teamwork environment. And then last, you're gonna engage in small groups to learn how to use scientific thinking to solve abstract problems. So in other words, you're gonna arrive at what's best for a patient, even if there's not a direct quote, correct answer to the problem, using a team approach and using the skills that the scientific process offers you, you're gonna be able to arrive at really the best possible solution given the information that you have. And so we focus all of this through a view on science, but I wanna remind you that science is just one piece of the pie. As you go through in your life as a professional, you're gonna gain experience and hopefully your practice life is not your first year of practice repeated sequentially each year after that, Hopefully each year it's a growing experience for you and you learn something new every single year that changes what you do or how you do it. And also it relies on us making sure that we connect the dots between what the science has to offer us and what patients need from us because not every patient needs all the science. Imagine if you will, a patient who really doesn't want or need to get rid of the pain in their hands that they have from osteoarthritis from years of working with their hands Maybe they just need enough relief and enough function so that they can play the piano because that's the true joy in their life. So with the knowledge that the patient offers us, it allows us to apply the science in a best way that helps to make the patient feel better. And that's it. I'm done talking. Thank you so much, Dr. Schultz. Um really wonderful words and incredible to learn a bit more about evidence-based practice and why that's so important in the pro chiropractic profession. So thank you so much. Um, does anybody have any questions for Dr. Schultz? Again, you are welcome to use that Q&A function. And like I promised earlier, I'm going to send um, Dr. Kayser and Dr. Schultz um, email addresses to both of you. So give me just one second and I'll put those in the chat. We'll start with Dr. Schultz. No questions from anybody? <laughs> Okay, let me get Dr. Um, Kayser's for everybody, just in case either of you think of something and want to reach out to them later. Oh, we do there's have one a, yeah, question. A question. Yeah, we do. So, so wondering how many units are expected to take each quarter. And so I assume credits is what this individual is wanting to know about. So I'm looking at my little cheat sheet over here because I don't have this memorized, but there is usually on average, about 25 credits a quarter, which does sound daunting. And I did say that it is a rigorous program. The, the, oh, this may make it easier to wrap your head around those 25 credits. Oftentimes they are, they're joined, they're, there are many courses within the quarter. Let's see if I can get this out. I'm, I've got all this evidence in my head from Dr. Schultz right now. We try to tie the courses together in such a way that it doesn't seem like such a daunting amount of material. So for instance, surface anatomy in Q1 is 
very much tied to gross anatomy, which is very much tied to the radiology courses, which is very much tied to biomechanics. So you take those all together. Yes, the number of credits sounds outrageous, but they are tied together in some fashion, if that helps. Um, thank you for that question. There's another one there. Are most of the classes taught by the same professors? I kept singing Dr. Schultz's praises, didn't I? So it sounded like <laughs> Dr. Schultz and I were the only ones holding down the fort here. Um, there are a number of courses taught by the faculty. We have clinical educators that, that make up about six faculty members. We have full-time faculty here in the preclinical program that are about 25. So you will see instructors on multiple occasions, but here's the thing, we really put them in the place where they belong. In other words, they are experts in those courses, and why would I find someone else if I have someone that is such an expert in so many different areas? I'm going to keep them there. So I hope that answers your question, Olivia. That oh, begs that the question, Olivia, that what was in the world earlier. am I doing? <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> I'm all over like mayonnaise, human beings. I yes, see you in first were. quarter, second quarter, fourth quarter, fifth quarter, eighth quarter, 10th and 11th. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you can't escape me. So, you know, think about that. Very talented and diverse. <laughs> and then Olivia is asking, could you give some more information on what tests are like and grading? Good question, Olivia. So many of the exams are going to be multiple choice, short answer, matching, um, Dr. Schultz, I'll let you talk a little bit about you, how you assess students in your courses. Um, the grading is off in a lot of our labs, it's pass fail. And then in a lot of our lecture courses, then there is a grade. So you need to achieve at a level of C or higher in order to successfully complete that class. A D is not an acceptable grade. It, it's an acceptable grade, but you're going to have to retake the course, in, in other words. So um, I hope that answers that question. Go ahead and tell us a little bit about your grading. Dr. Sure. In, in the courses that I teach, um, and, and I've, I've been teaching for a long, long time, three plus decades, and I have tried all of the methods. I think I've covered them all. Um, and I have to tell you that, that when it comes to examinations, um, first of all, you need to know that we do have a finals week here, and it is a relatively intense experience, and I hate it, hate it, hate it, hate it, hate it. If I could get rid of one thing, it would be finals weeks. But having said that, that doesn't change the reality that we're going to have them. So here's how I approach it. When I do my tests, my tests are asynchronous and they're online, which means that I will put them online. You'll have a limited availability of time with the test itself, but you'll have a window of time that's several days in which you can choose to take the test. I allow you to use your notes. In fact, I put together a note packet for you to prepare for the test. So if you have accessed the material, engaged the material, and you have let the material wash over you as you've gone through the weeks leading up to an examination, and you get what I famously call my review sheets, and you go through those review sheets and you let those wash over you a couple of times, you are very well prepared to take the test. But even if you're not, you get to keep that review sheet with you when you take your test. I do use short answer and short answer essay type questions because I want you to talk to me. Um, and so that's how it works. Um, I like to think that, that the ability of taking the exam at home, um, wherever you want actually, if you like Starbucks, then you do you. Um, I also like to think that having some resources with you, even if you don't need them, is of comfort. It helps to reduce testing anxiety. And I happen to believe that testing anxiety is the difference between a 90% and an 80%. I think if you're really nervous about a test, you are gonna have a harder time with that test. So I wanna take that particular bias out of the equation um, and let students really feel and where they're at. And I tell students in my lead up to an examination, I tell them to make sure that you get your capybaras set up in the tub with some nice warm water and some orange slices so that they can relax and that'll make you relax. Yes, my favorite animal on the planet is capybaras. I'll shut up now. I do want to mention our lab. So a lot of our technique courses, those are face-to-face -face practical exams. So, you know, you have to perform in front of your instructor and achieve certain outcomes for those courses. So that would be another testing method. I hope that answers that question. I think that was from Olivia. 
And then I see another question here on most of the classes face to face, or at least have the option to be. Here's the thing I made it sound like there are a lot of synchronous courses. There are a lot of synchronous, there may be synchronous components to the course, but oftentimes the faculty wants you on campus for at least one hour for one hour of lecture a week. They'll have some other things that they put online for you to to look at, to engage in. They'll engage with you, whether it's open office hours, whether it's during you just emailing them, whether it is some small group sessions, but you are asking about face-to-face -face, and their majority of our courses have a face-to-face -face component. Obviously all the labs do. Does that help? I hope answer that question. And Dr. Schultz, do you have anything to add to that? No, no I think we carefully, especially in the COVID era where we have really emphasized online learning um, I think in the wake of all of that, um, we are really trying to be extra conscious about those things that we need to schedule into your day and those things which perhaps in a more cafeteria style laid back fashion, we can provide the content. I know that's been a real question. Dr. Kayser, in fact, had a conversation with me as we were beginning to come out of this. She said, look, you teach a lot of different things in a lot of different ways. You need to sort this out. You need to figure out exactly what you want this to look like in 2022, 2022. 2023. And I have to tell you, that was a big task. I really, really mm -hmm. took that to heart. Um, as much as I absolutely adore time with students and having the opportunity to talk with them and have conversations, um, you guys are busy as students. And so I'm really trying to be extra, extra careful and respectful of the time that students need to not be sitting in a room, staring at my ugly face, yapping away at them. Thank you. And then there's a question, is the course's content synchronous to the NBCE order? I'm not sure I'm it understanding. Is. Okay. It is. I get the question. That, yeah. Oh, you're good. looking to see if we teach courses in a sequence that's going to allow somebody to take their national board exams gotcha. at a time that's, that, you know, they still have a little biochemistry left inside their skull. Um, and yes, we do try to do that. Thank you for answering that. And then, so can the test be taken more than once before the deadline? I think that's for you, Dr. Schultz. Generally, no. Um, it's a graduate program. Our hope is that preparation has brought you to that moment. Um, I will say this, I have had circumstances where students have had, um, uh, you know, they've gotten in the middle of an examination and because they're doing an examination at home, um, Wi-Fi hates on them, that happens. Um, they've had a crisis at home. I mean, it's, a, I don't know how people do it going to school and having kids at home, but it happens a fair amount. And, um, I'll tell you what, man, if you've got a seven-year-old that demands your attention, you're going to have to just bail on the test. And in those circumstances, I absolutely insist that they have a second bite out of the apple. Um, but in general, we try not to do that. I, I think students, um, in general, really they take the test once because they have to taking it a second time would seem punitive to most people. Thank you, Dr. Schultz. That's great information. You saw that breathing, right? Go ahead. Yeah, I'm going to jump in on this next question. Sure. Um, there's a question that says, I see that there are hotel accommodations for those touring the campus and who are traveling more than 60 miles. I'm just wondering if you have any info on what those accommodations are. That's a great question. We do have some hotel accommodations for anybody who wants to schedule a formal campus tour if you're coming more than 60 miles. Um, the best way to go about asking specifically what those accommodations might be is to contact our campus visit. Um, website and I'm going to post that in the chat right now so you guys can all see that website. Um, we offer campus tours every day with an admissions advisor like myself. We also offer tours with a student ambassador. Um, so that student is a current chiropractic student. Uh, if you kind of want to get that um, interaction with a current student and kind of pick their brain a little bit since if we're working administration we're not chiropractors. Um, our admission staff is not chiropractors ourselves, but we're very knowledgeable about the program. Um, but yes, we do have some accommodations for students coming more than 60 miles. Um, so go ahead and click on that link. Um, and then there's some contact information on this page. Sorry, I'm looking at two screens, but on this on that link, I just sent you there's some contact information on how to schedule a tour and who to talk to about accommodations. And that's going to be our campus visits at uws.edu, that's the email on the website. Go ahead and um, ask them and one of my colleagues will get back to you with exactly what all that entails. And we do hope that you 
um, come visit campus because it's absolutely beautiful. We actually just built a new campus right before COVID hit. So it's had very little foot traffic and it's absolutely beautiful on the campus and we'd love to have you there. Um, and just a shameless plug at three o'clock, um, I'll be talking a little bit more about admissions requirements and we will be taking you through a um, virtual tour of campus at three o'clock today. Um, you can also find that virtual tour on the website I just dropped, so spoiler alert there. Um, but we'd love to see you later this afternoon um, in that presentation or in person on campus. Um, one more question, yeah. Great question. Are there any prospective students events happening this summer in person? I don't know of any that are happening in person other than our campus tours. Um, we do have several virtual events throughout um, the summer for each individual department. So this is our biggest event right now for chiropractor students. We will have other virtual events for our online programs. And the reason they're virtual is because those programs are online. We want people to be able to participate from all over. Um, for new incoming students, there will be in-person, um, oh my gosh, what's the word called? Like orientations and things like that later in the summer. Um, but as far as prospective student events right now, almost all of them are virtual so that we can try to accommodate people from all over the place. But I love that suggestion, Chantel, and I will definitely um, talk to some of my colleagues and see if there's something we can do to have an in-person um, prospective student, I don't know, meet and greet or big group tour, something like that, because I think that would be really fun to meet more people in person. So thanks for asking. And maybe we can even get you to meet Dr. Schultz. I think that would be an entertaining activity. What do you think, Dr. Schultz? <laughs> Most people can't wait to not see me, so it would be a refreshing change for sure. <laughs> well, perfect. Um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. I don't want to take you guys more than an hour, like I promised. Um, but thank you so much to each of you for attending today to our Doctor of Chiropractic um, workshop week. We're so excited again to have you. Um, it always makes our events better when students actually come. <laughs> so thank you so much for coming. Um, if you refer back to the chat, I dropped a link um, for the chiropractic workshop week. If you'd like to come to any more sessions that we're doing this afternoon at 3 p.m. Pacific time, we have two sessions tomorrow, two sessions Thursday. We'd absolutely love to have you and they'll be recorded if you can't make them live. Um, if you have any other questions, you know, please feel free to reach out Dr. Schultz and Dr. Kayser. Um, I will add my email here as well. <laughs> in case any of you want to reach out to me for questions. Um, thank you again so much for coming. I hope you all have a fantastic rest of your week. Um, and thank you for considering UWS. <laughs>